Every once in a while, someone writes a book that is extremely good and extremely well written and sitting down and reading it for 30 minutes just makes you feel smarter. And this is that book. This book is called How to Solve It and it was written by George Polya, who was a very famous mathematician. And this is a legendary book. It has sold millions of copies and I'm pretty sure it's still in print. A system of thinking which can help you solve any problem. I want to emphasize that this is not a textbook. You can actually buy this book, sit down and read it and learn from it. It is written for everyone. Sometimes old books have really cool dust jackets. And so before we talk about this book and how awesome it is, look at this, The Meaning of Relativity by Albert Einstein. This third 1950 revision of Professor Einstein's classic on the theory of relativity contains the widely publicized theory of gravitation which attempts to interrelate all known physical phenomena. And you can buy the book for $2.50. <laughs> really cool. There's some other old classic books here. And on the back here, they're advertising a book by John von Neumann, right? Really old school. Okay, I took the dust jacket off because I really want to preserve my copy. This is a really old printing of this legendary book. And so on the inside cover, you see this, how to solve it. And then on the back inside cover, you see the same thing, how to solve it. And so basically this is the main idea behind the whole book, right? It gives you a step-by-step -step method that you can actually follow and it will help you solve any problem, not just math problems. Before we talk about the steps, I just wanna show you, this is actually a signed copy that is George Polya's handwriting, so cool. The entire book is centered on discussing these four steps. It gives all kinds of practical examples and it further emphasizes what is taught here. So let's just spend a little bit of time going through these four steps really carefully because they're really interesting. And then we're gonna look at some of the stuff that's inside this book. And I wanna mention that this book is a really good read. The biggest con to this book is that it's really hard to put it down, in fact, I was reading it and I didn't even wanna make this video because I wanted to keep reading it, but I thought, no, I have to tell someone about how great this book is. So the first step is you have to understand the problem. And so if you're a math student, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have to understand the definitions, what the terms are, what the question is asking. And here he gives you some tips on understanding the problem. What is the unknown? What are the data? What is the condition? The second step is to Find the connection between the data and the unknown. You may be obliged to consider auxiliary problems if an immediate connection cannot be found. You should obtain eventually a plan of the solution. And over here, he talks about devising a plan. You know, have you seen it before? Do you know a related problem? Look at the unknown. Here is a problem related to yours and solved before. Could you use it? Could you restate the problem? talks about going back to definitions, et cetera, all kinds of useful tips. The third step is especially important in mathematics. It's carrying out your plan. And here he gives you a very specific statement. Carrying out your plan of the solution, check each step. Can you see clearly that the step is correct? Can you prove that it is correct? This is often something that students have a hard time with when they're first learning higher level math, when they're first writing proofs. It's really important that you understand every single step when you're carrying out your plan. In other words, your solution or your proof. This fourth step is often one that is overlooked and I had a teacher who passed away several years ago who would always make a big deal about this. Examine the solution obtained. So looking back, can you check the result? Can you check the argument? Can you derive the result differently? Can you see it at a glance? Can you use the result or the method for some other problem? So those are the main four steps that Polya describes in his book, and he gives tons of other information in the book. Let's go ahead and jump into the book, and I'm gonna show you some of the cool stuff that I have found in this incredible book. Here's the inside, How to Solve It, A New Aspect of Mathematical Method by G. Polya, Stanford University, Princeton, New Jersey, Princeton University Press. And I wanna emphasize that these ideas can be applied to other things besides math. The book is written in a very general way, as you see, and you'll see that you don't really need a lot of math to actually read this book. The book does have a contents, but I'll be honest, I'll go through it quickly because I just basically started reading the book from the very first page, skipped stuff that I didn't think was that interesting, 
and just kept reading through it and you will be surprised the kinds of things that you will find in this book. Here's an example of George Pollya making a brilliant observation. And this book is brilliant, by the way. All the questions and suggestions of our list are natural, simple, obvious, just plain common sense. But they state plain common sense in general terms. They suggest a certain conduct which comes naturally to any person who is seriously concerned with his problem and has some common sense. But the person who behaves the right way usually does not care to express his behavior in clear words, and possibly he cannot express it so. Our list tries to express it so. This man was a genius, and the entire book is written in this fashion. Part two, how to solve it a dialogue. This is a beautifully written section, which is a pleasure to read. So basically he asks three questions. Where should I start? What can I do? What can I gain by doing so? And then basically, there's little headings, so getting acquainted, and then you answer those questions. Working for better understanding, again, you answer those questions. Where should I start? What can I do? What can I gain by doing so? Hunting for the helpful idea, again, you ask those same three questions. Carrying out the plan, ask the same three questions, and then looking back, and you ask the same three questions. And it's a really short section, and it reads incredibly well, and I feel like whenever you're stuck, you can just pick up this book and it just helps clarify your thought processes. Here he talks about analogy. Analogy pervades all our thinking, our everyday speech, and our trivial conclusions as well as artistic ways of expression and the highest scientific achievements. Analogy is used on very different levels. People often use vague, ambiguous, incomplete, or incompletely clarified analogies, but analogy may reach the level of mathematical precision. All sorts of analogy may play a role in the discovery of the solution, and so we should not neglect any sort. And then he gives examples here, specific mathematical examples of how you can use analogy. Here he talks about finding an auxiliary problem. This is really interesting. Auxiliary problem is a problem which we consider not for its own sake, but because we hope that its consideration may help us to solve another problem, our original problem. The original problem is the end which we wish to attain. The auxiliary problem, a means by which we try to attain our end. This part here is very interesting. An insect tries to escape through the window pane, tries the same again and again, and does not try the next window, which is open and through which it came into the room. A man is able, or at least should be able, to act more intelligently. Human superiority consists in going around an obstacle that cannot be overcome directly and devising a suitable auxiliary problem when the original problem appears insoluble. To devise an auxiliary problem is an important operation of the mind. To raise a clear-cut new problem subservient to another problem. To conceive distinctly as an end what it what is means to another end is a refined achievement of the intelligence. It is an important task to learn or to teach how to handle auxiliary problems intelligently. And here he gives a very classic example of an auxiliary problem that most people learn in an algebra class. You have a quartic equation and he makes a substitution and then you have a new problem and this is considered the auxiliary problem. Here he talks about the profit that you can derive from considering an auxiliary problem. And he talks about two types of profit. Basically, you can use the result of the auxiliary problem or you can use the method of the auxiliary problem. Whereas, you know, the method of the auxiliary problem might give you insight to new methods, operations, or tools, which we can later use for our original problem. So a very, very interesting discussion of problem solving. He even talks about the risk of using an auxiliary problem. Risk, we take away from the original problem the time and the effort that we devote to the auxiliary problem. If our investigation of the auxiliary problem fails, the time and effort we devoted to it may be lost. Therefore, we should exercise our judgment in choosing an auxiliary problem. We may have various good reasons for our choice. The auxiliary problem may appear more accessible than the original, or it may appear instructive, or it may have some sort of aesthetic appeal. Sometimes the only advantage of the auxiliary problem is that it is new and offers unexplored possibilities. We choose it because we are tired of the original problem, all approaches to which seem to be exhausted. This is an interesting portion of the book where he talks about definitions. Definition of a term is a statement of its meaning in other terms 
which are supposed to be well known. Then he talks about technical terms and how there are two kinds. Some are accepted as primitive terms and are not defined. Others are considered as derived terms and are defined in due form. That is, their meaning is stated in primitive terms and in formally defined derived terms. Thus, we do not give a formal definition of such primitive notions as point, straight line, and plane. Yet we give formal definitions of such notions as bisector of an angle or circle or parabola. And here he gives the definition of a parabola and uses that as an example. There's a little number here, the three. Let's look at that. He says, in this respect, ideas have changed since the time of Euclid and his Greek followers who defined the point, the straight line, and the plane. Their definitions, however, are scarcely formal definitions, rather intuitive illustrations of a sort. Illustrations, of course, are allowed and even very desirable in teaching. No problem-solving book is complete without a discussion of determination, hope, and success. It would be a mistake to think that solving problems is a purely intellectual affair. Determination and emotions play an important role. Lukewarm determination and sleepy consent to do a little something may be enough for a routine problem in the classroom, but to solve a serious scientific problem, willpower is needed that can outlast years of toil and bitter disappointments. Here he talks about how your determination will fluctuate. This part is really interesting. So here there is something in French and then he translates it here, I believe. You can undertake without hope and persevere without success. Thus may speak an inflexible will or honor and duty or a noble man with a noble cause. This sort of determination, however, would not do for the scientist who should have some hope to start with and some success to go on. In scientific work, it is necessary to apportion wisely determination to outlook. You do not take up a problem unless it has some interest. You settle down to work seriously if the problem seems instructive. You throw in your whole personality if there is a great promise. If your purpose is set, you stick to it, but you do not make it unnecessarily difficult for yourself. You do not despise little successes. On the contrary, you seek them. If you cannot solve the proposed problem, try to solve first some related problem. So how do you use this book? In my opinion, the best way to use this book is to simply pick it up and read it and enjoy it. It is a pleasure to read. It has all kinds of really interesting questions that, again, are common sense, but you don't think to ask them. And Palia has done that in this magnificent book. He has basically laid out a clear, concise thinking pattern. As it says here on the cover, a system of thinking which can help you solve any problem. And I feel like it's a book that you will read more than once. I've had it for a while now and I've already read certain sections more than once. And whenever you're stuck on a problem, you know, whether it be a math problem or maybe you're taking a science class or maybe it's something else, right? You can really apply this, you know, thinking process to any problem. And I love how he has it on the front cover and also on the back inside cover as well. He has those four steps and those various hints. So owning the book, I think is worth it because you can refer to it often. I will try to leave a link in the description. I am pretty sure that this book is still in print. This book, I believe has sold, I think, I think millions of copies, right? It is a legend of a book and it can help you solve your problems, I think. It's a really nice way to just clarify your thinking. George Paglia was an amazing Hungarian mathematician and he was one of the Martians. So if you don't know what that is, just Google it. Uh, kind of a random thing I found on the internet. Uh, so was Paul Ordosh as well and Paul Hamels. I hope this video has been helpful to you. Good luck.